the opium, like the plant itself, because um, heroin is like the most addictive kind of drug that you can get. So from like a plant perspective, before it turns into heroin, is it not as addictive? Is there something yeah. chemically that's not making it as addictive? So it's funny, you can talk about it in the context of brain if, if you want even. Uh, no, so, so generally, the, the question of what's addictive is very much a question of uh, perception. So, so if you go, if you get, if you have car accident tomorrow and you go to the hospital, uh, you will get heroin in different form, but that is what also we give patients in the hospital for anesthesia. Yeah, so you, you were in LA, you said, for, for a little bit. How, how, long, how much time did you spend there? I, so I have this thing. Um, that we, I don't know if you wanted to, to, to be on camera or not, but I'll tell you uh, that I take uh, some time every year, about a month, and I go traveling. So this is me taking away and taking off and, and going away for weeks at a time uh, in kind of no work, no emails, no nothing. And I usually try to use that to do one of the things, like either learn something, like I go and I learn a skill, or I uh, spend time going through an experience that I would not normally go through, like learn some something that is experiential, like meditate or something like this. So I, yeah. every year I pick something and I do it with friends. And the, the way we do it is we announce what the thing is going to be, and then we let people from all over the world, internet and France, uh, sign up to join us. And then they join for oh, wow. segments. So we kind of, so this year we had all kinds of uh, experiences that we went to for the last months. And a period of that was going through deserts and kind of trying to leave like people who live in the desert, really hunter gatherers. And uh, so it brought all kinds of people that are into athleticism and kind of adventure. That oh, that's cool. Thing. And we passed by Grand Canyon and Sedona and like the US versions of deserts. And we, in Arizona, we've been to the Sinai Desert in Israel, crossed that one. So we had kind of a few styles and a few types of deserts. And that was kind of what got me to cross through in California and Arizona and Nevada and Utah. Oh, it's amazing. So you're saying people from just online can actually join you physically in these in-person experiences. So how many did you end up being? So my friend who is organizing the kind of the online, let's say, uh, what you call it, surveys, he's, he himself is a scientist who's kind of popular and famous. And I think a lot of people generally like to be in his presence. So he yeah. put it on his blog and said, me and two friends are going to do this thing. If you want to join us, apply here. And he put a long form that he made up with all kinds of weird questions that he said, I'm going to select people based on those. So it would be questions like, uh, I don't know, what would you take if you go on an island uh, for a year? Uh, who, which person you would never want to meet and stuff like that. Like weird questions that he came up with. And he had, I think, thousands of applicants from all over the world. And most of them, of course, people that we don't know anything about and they just filled it and he spent hours reading through those and filtering that and choosing, choosing groups of people to choose to, to join for each experience so you know, one of them was every person there was some random like he said every person who has a birthday within this month gets to join on their birthday so he says oh, hey, okay. Sean your birthday is like March 16 on that day we're going to be in Grand Canyon if you want join us and there was a day with only six-year-olds only kids so like a, full, a, a group of kids that kind of go and there was only women for one day and the only people who uh, experienced a loss and wanted to kind of reflect on that so so really kind of different wow. types of people and and the, the, the rules of the experience were i think there were three rules and i now of course would forget them but the rule number one is that Whatever happens on the trail stays on the trail. So you can share stories uh, 
which is why I can't tell you too much about like the yes, stories yes. we heard. <laughs> so that was rule number one. I think rule number two was uh, that on the beginning of every day, people have to share an embarrassing story about themselves. This would be your introduction to everyone else. And the way by which we choose who starts was uh, age. So the oldest person starts and then the younger and younger and younger until the youngest person. Mm. So you kind of have to tell how old you are and tell an embarrassing story and instruction. And I think there was a third one, I can't remember, that made it uh, very you know, intimate quickly. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. So when, when you were talking about the learning uh, week, I thought it was similar to like what Bill Gates does, where he goes off to his island, doesn't have any electronics and just reads or does something where he, or it's called the think week and he just goes off. But for you, it's more of a social experience that like helps you reconnect with friends. And Depends. Do so we also had, so for instance, there, there was a period when we did the first, uh, I think it was the first 10 days. It was in the Sinai desert. And it was a, with the Bedouins. So those are the people who live in the desert there. And they basically are the kind of kings of the desert. They have no power, no electricity, no water, no running water, no, of course, wireless or anything. And with these guys, we lived the way you live if you were you know, 6,000 years ago in a desert. So they oh. pick what they eat. They know how to know kind of which types of I don't know, mushrooms or, or plants are are the ones you can eat and which ones are poisonous. And of course, they have to teach you that. Their medicine is plant-based or kind of... So we lived for 10 days with these guys and then there were no internet, no anything. You know, you sleep where you, wherever you stop, that's where you sleep for the night. There are camels that uh, you set free and you hope that they're going to go straight and you try to catch them on the other side with stuff that you want to carry. If you can't carry it on you, you put it in a camel and you kind of find the valley that the only way for the camel to go is to go straight and it will take the camel enough time that you can actually go on a different route and meet the camel on the other end. And so really like all kinds of things that I would never imagine. So that, that would be the closest to this uh, Bill Gates experience where you have no communication and you use that time to you know, come up with clever ideas. Yeah. Where was that? This was in the Sinai desert. So it's, it's Egypt. Uh, there's a kind of part that is, it's, it, it technically belongs to Egypt, but it was at some point, Israel and they exchanged this territory and you know if today is the day of Passover uh, for Jews it's the uh, desert that the Jews who crossed from Egypt to Israel crossed over supposedly 40 years it takes about two weeks to do it by foot but I guess they went in a very strange route so it's this desert between Egypt and Israel and uh, it even though it practically uh, for all matters uh, an Egyptian territory, the Egyptians don't really go there. So the Bedouins are the kind of lords of this huge, huge desert. And they're the ones who really know how to go through places. We experienced a lot of interesting things and a lot of sad things. So, so one of the things, so, so one of the ways by which they, they make a living, those uh, Bedouins, uh, is there's five tribes there. And uh, you know, between them, they have very clear indication of like who owns what. Like for you, it looks like a regular desert, and you won't know that there's now a crossing between tribe one and tribe two. But they have a very clear understanding that this river indicates the end of tribe one's territory in tribe two. And many of those tribes make a living by growing opium, uh, poppy seeds, which uh, you know, if you follow the chain, it actually becomes heroin, and it becomes a drug that kills a lot of people and is doing very bad things for the world. And yet you see these guys not even knowing that what they're doing in secret, of course they know it's illegal, but they don't really know why, is going to lead to a lot of devastation, you know, miles away in different kind of processing. And you see them as farmers, like they have fields and fields of hidden areas between two valleys that kids age 12 with M16s are kind of farming and getting the, the kind of liquid that comes from the plant and putting it in jars and sending it somewhere else. And they don't really, like, so you as a Westerner, you kind of see, I know what this is and I know it's going to end. And they just, you know, work as farmers, not even realizing what's going on. So it's kind of like sad to see those kind of clash of cultures. Yeah. You, you don't think they know that eventually that leads to heroin and that, yeah. So the adults that tell the kids what to do definitely know what they're doing. The kids who do this thing, they you know get a little allowance for doing something. I think they have a sense that it's something bad because they are told, 
you can't tell anyone where this field is and only you know so only if you walk with one of the guides there do you end up like in a place like that without being shot so if, if you showed up by yourself there someone's going to shoot you they have like m16 and they got the pace so the kids know that they should shoot someone who comes close who's not kind of coming from the tribe they even have all kinds of stories uh, you know the, the american government of course wants this to end so they put pressure on the egyptian government to put an, to put an end to that egyptian one government on the one hand wants to do that but it's very useful for them to have the bedouins those those kind of lords of the desert be there because these guys are actually fighting isis and preventing isis from coming to egypt so the government actually gives them those weapons so they do whatever they do in this place but mostly protect this area from isis coming to egypt so there's like a so but, but because americans are put, pressuring them once a year the egyptian government kind of let the bedouins know that they're gonna do a raid on one field for show and all the kids and other bedouins disappear from this area they leave it and then suddenly a lot of helicopters pop up and they burn it all and they send the americans a video look we're fighting a uh, drug kind of creators in the area then they leave the day after the Bedouins come and plant everything again. So it's a, it's a wow. really a way to kind of see how the real world works when it comes to, um, you know, Western world versus the kind of very hunter gatherers cultures. And so, so, so the adults definitely know it's illegal. The kids have a sense that it's illegal. And even the teenagers who work there, uh, I think they know not only that it's, somewhat not okay they even know that it's uh, affecting their brain so some of them actually use it so when we walked through the places we saw that they they pick a plant and they taste it and the effects of kind of just directly tasting the plant are more like the effects of a, an anesthetic rather than like a high so they don't feel what heroin would make you feel but they feel something and it's enough for them to kind of have a sense that this thing is affecting their brain, so to speak, and they know, okay, I guess this is where it's going. So, so I think that they have a somewhat sense of what they're doing and they choose to not think about it too much when they do it. And we could not not think about it because we know exactly what's going on there. The opium, like the plant itself, because um, heroin is like the most addictive kind of drug that you can get. So from like a plant perspective, before it turns into heroin, is it not as addictive? Is there something chemically that's not making it as addictive? So it's funny, you can talk about it in the context of brain if, if you want even. Uh, no, so, so generally, the, the question of what's addictive is very much a question of uh, perception. So, so if you go, if you get, if you have a car accident tomorrow and you go to the hospital, uh, you will get heroin in different form, but that is what also we give patients in the hospital for anesthesia. So we are mm. using it as a kind of a way. So you, you get a very pure version of opium in every hospital if you're in extreme pain and you don't get addicted. So partially the addiction is the attaching of the pleasure ex experience or pleasant experience to the wanting. So I'll, I'll give you a con concrete kind of a, a way to think about it. Um, there's this famous, famous study from the 80s, I believe, on drugs. And this study became the kind of, I don't know, hallmark study uh, that the government used for 40 years to show that drugs are bad and that they're addictive and that they're gonna kill us and we should ban them. And it was changed in the last couple of years. So the study, the original one, I think the drug uh, that was used was a version of heroin, if I'm not mistaken. It was that study done with rats. And they basically, if I'm spelling it correctly, put a rat in a cage and the cage had two levers and every minute she could pull one lever and get a reward and the lever on the right would give her food so if she pulled it she gets food and she is enjoying the reward that is in the form of that and if she pulls the lever on the left it essentially gives her directly to the brain what would be a drug that's pure it activates an area that's called a VTA, the ventral tegmental area, an area that uh, with humans is the highest form of pleasure. It's the same area that uh, activates when you have an orgasm. So it's, it's pure pleasure for a few seconds. And the rat could only choose one or the other. So either food 
or pleasure that comes from the level of addiction that you get when you use kind of extreme drugs. And the rats in the experiment died of hunger because they kept pressing the joy liver mm. and getting those wow. kind of zaps of activity to the VTA that they were unable to stop and they died out of starvation. So yeah. this study basically showed us that uh, if you give people the option to survive or to get the uh, kind of one more dose, people would kill themselves and would choose drugs. And it became the kind of poster boy uh, study that was used by all agencies, uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, the NIDA was like using that and to show basically drugs are bad and they're addictive and they're gonna kill you. And it was the case for many years and I think a few years ago, maybe less than eight years ago, I think, the guy who ran the original study had a version of it that flipped everything upside down. So he did a version basically where you put the rat in the cage the way it did it before. There's a, one option, which is the option to uh, get the food, another option, which is the option to get the, the wood. But then outside the cage, kind of just next to the cage, he puts another cage full of other rats playing, like a theme park for rats. Just see a lot of friends playing. And, uh, and what he shows in the kind of version two is that yes, in the beginning, the rats choose the, the reward that gives them pleasure again and again and again. And after some time, they choose social life. They say, okay, mm. no food, no drugs. I wanna play with my friends. And they go and they kind of play on the theme park for rats. And this suggested that in a way, yes, drugs could be addictive. And if they're addictive to you, you might give up a lot of things to get just one more hit of the heroin. But if you offer an alternative, which is a social experience, that's even more pleasant to the brain than anything else. And people would choose social experiences is a reward to the brain pleasure. And that has a different consequence right now because this means that if you are a drug addict, uh, the way to treat you might be to just put you in a community with people and tell you, you know, we're not gonna stop you from doing drugs by telling you they're bad for you or they're gonna kill you or something. We're gonna just give you an alternative, which would be social life and friendship and like work and things that will make you part of a society. And this will make you choose to... this kind of theoretical idea was actually implemented in practice in some countries and it seems to work. So in Portugal, Portugal was the country with most drug usage in Europe for decades. Hmm. And about 15 years ago, they implemented a version of this study uh, where they said that every drug addict that comes out of prison is they used all the money that they used for the war on drugs before to actually give this person all the tools to integrate him in society. So they would uh, have employers hire you and they promised the employer that they will pay the employer whatever salary you're getting. So basically you're, you're a free labor. They, they pay the employer, the employer pays you and you work for the employer just as a way to get you a job. Uh, they will put you in communities where they would make sure that you live with people that kind of offer, and it worked. Portugal now is the least drug uh, kind of addicted country in Europe. So this suggests that this theoretical idea actually has merit in reality. That's interesting. Well, part of the experiment that I want to ask is, did the rats also have equal access to the heroin? Like meaning if they turned left, they had all of their friends there, but did they shut off access to heroin so that, okay. Yeah, so you have to choose that. friendship mm. or, or more drugs. Okay, got it. So that eventually allowed them to forget and it's not as easily accessible to, yeah. to get that. That's and I think, I, think, I think you're hitting, so some rats went back. So it's not, it's not like perfect. Some rats went back and some rats in the beginning spent X time with their friends and then equal amount of time with drugs and then back. So, so but in, in the end, even having the option already showed a really big difference between the version one where you just choose drugs no matter what to now you might still choose drugs a lot, but there's something, there's something that kind of makes you consider at least not using drugs. And it's about not food, it's mm. people. I, I'm curious, like, because uh, I actually had this conversation with someone uh, in my life where there seems to be certain people where they are kind of black and white. So when they get into something, whether it's like, it could be sugar, cigarettes, uh, and maybe to yourself as well, uh, but it could also be positive things where if they channel it the right way, their addictive personality allows them to go so focused 
uh, and you know achieve at the highest level. But if they were ever to get into something negative, like let's say drugs or anything like that, their innate personality has something channeled into them. So w- what is it about the makeup of our brains or, or as people that uh, are some people just more have that as addictive personality more than others? And what, what's the difference chemically? Oh, what a good question. So we can, so generally brains have kind of, I don't know, bench, benchmark levels. Some brains are more prone to addiction, some are less. It boils down to how you're wired and the levels of chemicals, if you want, in the brain. Um, there's a famous story of people who had Parkinson's uh, that's now in the 70s who received a drug that would help them with Parkinson's and they got the drug and the drug is helping them and indeed like the tremor that they have stops and they, they feel a lot more likely to engage in action so it does a great job and the drug basically was uh, some kind of dopamine that was what the drug was about and what the doctors who administered the drug started seeing that uh, those people who get the drug, they get better when it comes to Parkinson, but they start losing a lot of money uh, to gambling, mostly. Mm-hmm. And they start engaging in risky behavior, and they start drinking more and so on. And they kind of did a little study on the people who involved, and they realized that, yes, that's what's happening. Like, if you take all the people who get the drug, they behave a lot more recklessly than people who don't get the drug. Uh, and it turned out that what we learned was that dopamine is the chemical that also kind of is responsible for your reward seeking seeking behavior. So those people got a lot of dopamine that helps them suppress or kind of express more of some movement disorder, but uh, it also makes them more kind of addict looking and and risk seeking. So now if you buy this drug, it just has on the label, if this drug makes you wanna go gambling, please call your doctor. That's kind of what we did right (laughs) now. And and this shows basically that, that Brain is brain, but you can put chemicals in brain, or you can reduce chemicals in the brain, or you, the, the, and it will make people more addict, kind of act like more addicts or less addicts. And that that's something that is like in your brain. That's why I get asked often when I give talks whether I should use drugs. So there's like three questions I always get asked uh, when I give talks, no matter what I speak about. Someone asks about uh, gender, men and women. Someone asks about sex. Someone asks about drugs. Someone asks about ethics. Like those are kind of the classical questions that I get asked, no matter what I talk about. And with respect to drugs, I, it's usually kind of asking for a friend. Uh, should, should my friend, <laughs> I'm asking uh, for a friend. <laughs> yeah, do MDMA. And, and my answer is uh, generally kind of, I think, surprising to people when I say, I, I'm not going to tell you how to do drugs. I'm, I'm going to endorse whatever you want to do. If you are certain that your personality is not that of an addict. So the, the issue is the kind of the pressing of the liver at the expense of food. Some people have no problem. They, they take MDMA. They have a pleasant experience. They say, oh, it's amazing. I really feel connected to my partner. Or if they take mushrooms to earth, they have all the kind of experience they want. They recommend and say it was lovely. And I, I, I don't need to do it tomorrow again. And these people, first of all, they're the majority. Most people are that. And if you're that person, by all means, I would sign the prescription for you. Go try, explore, see how your brain works, expand your psyche totally in. If you're on the other group, then totally stay away and stay away from almost any type of drug because you never know where your brain's going to go and you never know uh, kind of how bad down the rabbit hole you can go. And in that sense, the nice thing is most people know. So most people know like very early on in their life if they're dead. So, so it's easy to know. And if you're not sure, ask your partner or your parents or your close friends, they will tell you right away. And if your friends tell you, you should not, then don't. Kind of yeah. like, don't say, well, only this time or I can do. And in that sense, I think uh, you asked me about myself. I gave you kind of a academic answer. I'm very much the opposite. That's why I'm a lot kind of uh, more risk tolerant. I know that I'm very strong-willed and not addictive. I never tried coffee in my life. Mm, Age uh, 16. Ever? Ever. Never tasted it. Age 16, I made a decision. I don't know even why. I can't remember. I was in high school and I said, I'm not going to have coffee. I I remember kind of the the, the the moment, but like I don't remember if there was a big moment. I'm not going to try coffee. And fine, age 16 is a problem. No one likes coffee. When I turned 18, I went to the army and you spend those many, many nights where you guard the base and it's uh, very late at night and all of your friends drink coffee to stay up. And I said, no, I decided I'm not going to drink coffee. I'm going to drink coffee. Fast forward, it's been almost 15, 20 years now. 
and I was a soldier. Oh, everyone around me uh, drinks coffee, high quality coffee. They, they really argue whether this espresso, that espresso with a latte and so on. Soy milk, almond. I know all the things. I even have a coffee machine at, in my place that my parents bought me. So when they come, they can uh, drink <laughs> coffee. So there's a really high quality coffee machine sitting there in my place that is not used otherwise. And I just decided I'm not going to drink coffee and I never have. Uh, in that sense, that, that ability demonstrates to me that I have pretty much this black and white personality that if I decide something, it's never going to happen. And that's it. And therefore, I think that I'm more okay with doing things that are risky because I know that I'm able to tolerate that. So you're saying you do have an addictive personality, but it's the willpower that you have. So you can play around with it more than most people can. I, I, no, I would, say, I would say that I have, so, I, I have the opposite. I'm, I'm so not, not addictive. Oh, that, I see. Okay. So, so I can decide that uh, something like I just like I can do something and say I really want it again, but I'm saying no, I'm not going to do it again, and this is it. it will never, so, so, and that that you know, it's easy to if you don't have it, it's very easy to say. Like I I, I can uh, put hundred dollars on the red three times, win, and say okay, I'm done. And mm. I think that people that have gambling challenge, they cannot. They really. It's very hard for them. And so, so to me, the, the example of the coffee says that I can decide that I'm not drinking coffee arbitrarily, age 16. And now you can kind of put coffee in front of my nose and it smells, the aroma is great. Smell, but I said, I, I like having decisions that I had, that I live with and don't change as an exercise on my brain. I think I wrote a year ago, I, I wrote, a, I think Business Insider asked me to write a 10 advice to my younger self, kind of like a, a column. And I think one of the uh, arguments I had there was that uh, it's useful to, first of all, know who you are generally, kind of know if you're addictive, know if you're risk like that. That's something that sooner in your life you learn who you are, you can work with that. So there's no bad personality, but, but there are kind of, for a personality, if you find the circumstances that work with that, you can actually create a really useful world. If you're addictive, don't put yourself in the heroin fields of Senai. If you're not addictive, go explore, learn how they work, and then you can talk about it in podcast and share with the world. So, so that, that's the thing. But what I also said is it's useful for almost every person as a muscle to try uh, to m- learn how to control their impulses when it comes to self-control as an exercise. So pick one thing that is uh, hard for you not to do and regularly put yourself in front of that thing and not do it and see how easy it is and actually exercise this muscle. It's, it's, it is a set of cells in the front of our brain that control our self-control or our impulse behavior. And it's like a muscle, you can train that. My little nephew who's seven years old, when we go to supermarket and they have the kind of next to the checkout, the, all the chewing gum and the candies, he's unable to stop. He has to get all of them. And that's because his brain right now did not develop this ability to self-control. For us adults, it's easier. We can see all the candies and say, well, not good for us, not gonna take it. And there's a spectrum. He sits here, we sit maybe here, but a lot of people sit somewhere in between. And I think that it's, the point is to know, first of all, where you are on this spectrum. And if you're somewhere that's not here, put yourself every day in front of this chewing gum place and see how easy it is for you and train this muscle mm. because you can move from here to here. In that sense, it's useful for everyone to have the ability to control or self-control. So there is an innateness of like someone being, uh, having an addictive personality. So, but it's also like a good thing for some people because if they can channel it into, let's say building their business or being really healthy, like it could be a really good positive effect for them. So okay. are you saying they can still control the downsides of an addictive personality, but wouldn't that also affect, would that also affect like how hard and how, focus they are with like the good sides because they're repressing I, everything i think that the way the way i think it's like muscle so you you train your muscle you have the muscle you can you can choose not never to lift uh, heavy things after you have the muscle or to every day lift the heavy things with the muscle but if you have the muscle you have the choice if you didn't train and you didn't have the muscle then one day if you want to lift the heavy things you, you won't be able to so so train the muscle and then you choose to apply it uh, when you try not to have the uh, sugary dessert and not apply it when you're thinking about your business and you want to kind of maximize the amount of effort you put in the business. So you will have the ability. The, the challenge is when you are not able to. 
when you, on the one hand, work late night and full time on your business, and then you also go and you gamble all in the casino because the same personality that got you to be successful also is the one that leads to your demise. You want to be able to say, I have the ability and I'm going to implement it here and I'm going to take it away from here. And for have, to have that thing, you have to train the muscle and then you can choose. Got it, got it. Speaking of something that's like kind of innate in terms of our brain chemistry, uh, I think one of the things that, uh, I forgot what the documentary was called. I, I think one of the things that you were working on or you were part of was, what's called like inside the man of a con artist or something like that. Is that, yeah. is that the right title for it? The psychology of con artists. Oh, no, no, you're right. They changed the name. Inside the mind of a con artist. You were right. I was wrong. Yes. Inside something the mind of a con artist. Yeah. 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 And, and I've actually been reading this book called the H factor, which talks about, uh, and I'm sure you've heard of it, like the, the hexaco versus, um, versus the five big personalities, which is ocean. And they talk about the honest and humility, which is, relatively new, like it's in the early 2000s that came out, which really talks about like the Machiavellianism and identifying people that may be con artists. Um, I'm not sure exactly what part of the documentary that you were, you were, you were part of, but, but what was fascinating is that oftentimes like con artists are actually super hard to identify. And like as a society, we fall for them over and over and over again. Um, what, what, like, what would you do to like even identify someone that is a con artist? Are there like giveaway things that you can just tell from? So, okay. So, so, oof, I, I, so I'll give you first the answer and then I'll elaborate if you want. So the audience can kind of say, okay, I just want to answer and then fast forward to the next one. Or if they want to know. So the, uh, generally, the answer is going to be very, the, the person who is the most on almost every domain in the center is the most likely to be a con artist. So they're not outliers. Con artists are not the people that are eccentric it's actually the person who is on every kind of distribution you think about, like who is like a neurotic, they're actually in the center, they're not neurotic, they're not uh, very emotionally uh, stable. On the agreeableness, they're, very, they're not too agreeable, they're not very disagreeable. The, 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 most of the artists we met, the one trait I would say that distinguishes them is that they know how to blend. They look like the average of everyone else. They don't look mm. like they stand out. So it's, it's much harder to be a con artist if you're kind of, sending out narcissism is the other trait that we noticed about all of them and the third one was the ability to uh, tell a story to themselves that uh, changes reality so they are able to really believe a distorted reality and in that sense uh, a lot of con artists uh, are people that we know and uh, kind of are visible so okay so this was the, the like answer. if you have a friend here's the kind of take them if you have a friend that you say this guy is the most normal he is like acting like in every op in every conversation. He has the middle opinion. He is relatively kind of normative on like you know has a girlfriend for many years, has a boyfriend for many years, got married young. Like everything about this person looks stable. That on average would be the most likely person to be a con artist because they're Damn. yeah. And unlike what we expect that they're gonna be like you know like in most movies, Darth Vader, he looks like. No one else, right? The villain looks like a villain. he wears black. He's evil to yeah. everyone. He's like mean to his employees, and he, that's not how con artists are in the real world. They're, they're like the world just doesn't look like okay. Bad guys look like bad guys, and Luke Skywalker is wearing white, and he's always good, and he's like you know helping grandmothers carry their groceries from the store, and he's uh, saving the world. It's usually a lot kind of more complex, and the people that are the least seemingly complex are the ones. Now let's now that we have that, so the audience can can get the bottom line. I'll tell you a bit more about this TV series. So this TV series was a TV series that I was involved with. I think it had six, six episodes. aired sometime in the winter, so a few months ago. Uh, and it was somewhere between documentary to drama. What happened is that uh, the production got access to six. They got even more, but that in the end, they chose those uh, six corn artists that all did a huge con, like a huge crime, mm -hmm. that whatever the crime was, it was kind of headline news in the country that it was a case. What's and an example of the crime? So one of them was a, a guy known as Mini Madoff. So he is the Bernie Madoff of Europe. So yeah. he's called Mini Madoff because Madoff stole $50 billion and he stole only $20 billion. So that's why he's Mini. But it was $20 billion, which is like the, one of the most amount of money that was stolen in uh, Europe. He's German, and you know, he was caught. And unlike Benny Madoff, who uh, 
kind of said right away, I'm guilty and put in prison. He also tried to fight it. So it was a kind of long and, and complex trial to basically find everything and, and track all the complicated ways by which he did it. But it was a Ponzi scheme of the same kind of style that Madoff did in the US, just in Europe. He ended up spending years in prison, came out, of course, he's an older guy now, and uh, is out of prison, he's sitting at home, and they got access to him and had him come over to a lab that we built and go through experiments. So the point was to study of con artists and also their behavior, kind of questionnaires and experiments on them and see if we can learn something that is generalizable about how they operate. And that is where we learned this, this thing that kind of was a surprise that they actually are extremely kind of normative. They're the average of everything. And, and we learned the things that I think are relevant to Americans who watch this thing right now it was, first of all, many of the con artists, uh, I would say that you hear from Silicon Valley, which is uh, you fake it till you make it. And if no one catches you in the process, you will actually work out. Uh, there are many, many stories we had from these people who basically said, look, it was a Theranos story. I didn't have a project that's working. I knew it, but I knew that I could get it to work in a year, two years, six months. So I was just kind of faking it for a while, thinking it's going to buy me time. I'm going to actually build the product that works. And then everyone's going to glorify me as a hero. And in that sense, I must say that they convinced me. They convinced me that, uh, that not that they're good people. They were lying. They knew that they were lying, but that it's happening a lot more than we think with people that are glorified. If you look at uh, companies like uh, Uber, or Apple or McDonald's, many of those companies that now we teach in business schools as like case studies for success, they started the same way. I think the Apple, you know, Apple is kind of the classical case study for a successful company. I'm sure I'm going to be sued after I say that, but I don't care. Uh, uh, they, you know, back in the days of Steve Jobs uh, running the company as a kid, I think they were uh, sued by, they, they called the company Apple and they were sued by I think Emmy Records was the record company in the UK who was representing the Beatles also. And I think they were the owners of the trademark. The trademark. And the student, you said you can't use the name Apple for your company. And Steve Jobs signed a contract that says, yes, we won't use it. Like we agreed, it's yours, we're not going to use it. And when Apple became wealthy enough, they just shifted to using it. And by now they're so rich that they would have won the trial just by money. So that's it, they stole. And I think that uh, similar, there's a story that this is kind of anecdote. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but a story of uh, the first launch of, I think, one of the Mac computers uh, where the presentation by Jobs on the stage was supposed to be him pressing a button and the computer saying hello. This was kind of the feature that they were going to say, look, we have a computer that can speak. You can type and it speaks. And half an hour before the show, it doesn't work. They update the new version, it doesn't work. It worked in some version, kind of in the lab, but it doesn't work right now. And they're about to launch. And I don't remember if they just downgraded to a different version so that they can show it on stage and pretend it's the recent one, but actually, or oh, that it even was a bigger scam that actually someone in the back just said, hello. Like, he <laughs> no I don't way. remember like, what, what level of like scam was it, but they yeah. did it and the stocks are kind of rising and everyone says, oh my God, and buying it. And they made it. So version two, it actually says hello. So everyone forgot. So this is Apple, and I think that uh, Uber has a similar story where they started Uber and it was illegal, and there was a company that competed with them that did it legally, like went to the medallion companies and made agreements with them in transportation, and, and just, Uber just did it, and it was illegal, yeah. but they got all the market, and by the time they were big enough, they had enough kind of power to fight legally and retroactively change the laws. McDonald's guys stole the McDonald's from, so on and on. It happens yeah, yeah. to a lot more companies than I think, and that's what I learned from this series was that we're surrounded by people who do bad things, manage to get away with it, and then we forget the past and we say, oh, we love uh, I don't know, Steve Jobs. He's a hero. And, and those con artists were just him that were caught before. Well, that was the thing, like with, uh, with particularly around Theranos and, and Elizabeth Holmes, is that she could have been successful in pretty much like any other thing. But the problem is, that what she's doing is so crucial and impactful, depending on the results of that for 
people's lives. It's healthcare, yeah, it's their livelihood. Exactly. And it's because of that, that it, it becomes the issue. But if she did like crypto, if she did something in like a different space that doesn't impact people, it just would not have been the, the case. So are you saying that like a lot of the con artists actually have like a similar brain makeup as someone like Steve Jobs or the founders of Uber, but the difference is that with these con artists, they were actually impacting, like if they channeled their efforts into like something else that wasn't impacting people's lives so directly, um, uh, that they had like, oftentimes like the makeup of a successful person that we admire today? Exactly. I, so I think I think that, so you're right. So Elizabeth Holmes, like the big thing that kind of distinguishes her is that she chose to work to do the scam in healthcare. If she were scamming in building cars or uh, building computers, or she would be either fired or or a hero. We, we, we would forgive her. Like, we can't forgive people who steal money from people and end up like making them go to the street like Bernie Madoff did. And we can't forgive people who make people believe that they have cancer when they don't. So th those are the people that, that kind of, that society doesn't forgive. Others, we tend to forgive and, and even glorify. We really like if, uh, if the WeWork guy uh, who now is kind of vilified tomorrow starts a company and becomes a billionaire, uh, we'll forget in four years and he could run for president and no one's going to remember that he was a crook like uh, two mm -hmm. years ago. It's like, it's like this is the, the memory of people is short and we love heroes. And so that's it. To your question about their brain, I think that the brains of these people are fantastic in terms of like how geniuses they were. We had one con artist, for instance, who was a uh, British, uh, it was all over the world. So there was like one from each country. One guy was British and his con was a uh, art forgery. So he's uh, you know, forging art, selling the art as if it was Da Vinci's and Van Gogh and, and for millions of pounds, making a, a fortune and then eventually got caught. His ability to make something that passes all the scrutiny of art experts. So they think this is a real Da Vinci was incredible. If yeah. he only chose to just do art, <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he, yeah, he yeah. could be like, he's a great artist. He could, you can give him a statue that sits in a museum and he can build in a few days a replica that experts cannot tell about. Imagine yeah. if he channeled that to build replicas for things we lost, like there's museums that uh, lose pieces of art and they need someone to restore them. You could do that. There are things that we have only like a, uh, parts of and you want to build like a full kind of like a status that were demolished and you want to fix them he could do that he just chose to channel that to something that is not you know helping society but uh, and that's it we lost our talent to to prison so do you think like a lot of these guys from a nurture perspective let's say the personality and the makeup of their you know the the their their, their brain power all that stuff is similar but it's the environment that they grew up. So for example, like I've heard that Chapos, the, 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 the drug uh, cartel in, leader in, in Mexico, like he, knowing that all the resilience and the ambition that he, he, if he grew up in Silicon Valley or if he grew up in New York, he probably would have been a billionaire either way. It's just the Agreed. makeup of how he was born. So is it more about the environment that really impacts people, even though they have the similar makeup? I, I would say that all of those con artists, had a similar uh, something in their past that uh, was at least in their story, a key moment that defined them in terms of like upbringing and made them who they are. Left by their parents, uh, you know, like lived in a very hostile environment. This, so there were some kind of, all, all six con artists had this kind of narrative. Now, I think that it's not kind of a, what's the word, a deterministic. So there are kids who have bad childhood who become not con artists. So it, 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 you have the capacity. So I guess, you know, there's nurture versus nature. There's a kind of the genetics versus a, the brain. You can change and you can control the environment. It requires effort. It requires uh, some uh, help sometimes. And, it, and we have different, different benchmarks. But if there's kind of one kid who's hearing it right now and he's in this bad experience right now, the message I would say is that there are ways to, to get out of even that. If like your brain is not uh, fixed, 
you can come out of things. It requires effort and it requires help. But you know, we can either a society build those playgrounds that will make the people with bad life have option to not keep pulling the left liver. And as doctors, we can even intervene in a very extreme way to shut down the part of your brain that enjoys heroin, if, if it's th that level, or make you want uh, something that you don't want right now. So we're, we're, as neuroscientists, getting better in even chirurgically intervening and changing your makeup. And when you're doing these interviews with these con artists, like, is there even a point of having a lie detection? Because one of the things you mentioned that really makes the difference of these con artists is that, I mean, it could also be successful entrepreneurs, as we just talked about, is that they believe their own makeup. And I've heard that one of the, one of the things, I don't know if this is true or not, like one of the ways to like pass the lie detection test is that they'll ask you like a series of questions before to measure your red, like your normal heartbeat and all that stuff. And one of the things you can do to trick it is like, if they ask you a normal question, which is like, Hey, what's your name? You can actually like trick your body just to make it seem like a higher level. So that when you do get caught in a, a lie, it'll be a similar level to what your original normal question was of like them thinking like, Oh yeah, your name is Sean. Like that's, that wasn't a lie. Um, so I guess like, is there, is there like even a point if they're going to believe their own lie? Oh yeah. So, so, so you can change the baseline of light detectors and then the baseline becomes higher. Now every lie is staying with the wrong baseline and you can, fool. it's not easy to do, but yes, that's, that's, that's one of the reasons that the lie detectors are not always valid in trials because some people are really good at that. I think that the common thing to the people that we interacted with, and I think it's true, you know, from what I understand to a lot of Elizabeth Olmses and, and the likes, is that uh, they have this ability brain-wise, and I can even explain to you if you want how it works, because we studied yeah. that in their brain, uh, to change reality. So they quickly come up with a new story, and they overwrite in their brain the original, and the new story becomes reality. Like they, they are able to forget that it wasn't the case. That's the level yeah. of, like, uh, of lie. So wow. the first person you have to lie to in order to be a con artist is yourself. Damn, damn. And for a normal person, if someone just wants to know if someone is lying or not, what, what, are, what are some of the key signs to look for verbally, non-verbally, all that stuff? So we had on the team a, a FBI, former FBI a body language expert. And, and I spent a lot of time with him kind of learning how he does his things. So I was the, the brain guy. He was the body guy. And I think that, uh, first of all, the, the kind of the short answer is told me that there's no kind of, you know, like you get red and that's a lie or you touch your lips and the lie, like the kind of the, the, the cartoon version of that, which is like you play poker and if they do this, they're lying. And that's not the case. Like there, there's no kind of tells at that level. What he calls them are like hotspots. There are a kind of things that people do very often that you want to investigate and probe more uh, frequently, you know, they said that uh, Elizabeth Holmes didn't blink and some of the criminals we did look at kind of, uh, you know, did some things. All of those things are not in of themselves like, oh, everyone who does that is a liar and so on. They, they're for that person, the thing that is unique to them. What, uh, what he would say is that uh, if you map enough of them in a conversation, you will start seeing pattern. So, so you and I talk now for like 15 minutes. Uh, I didn't pay attention to uh, kind of what things I say in, in, involve you kind of moving so on. But, uh, but if I started doing right now, maybe your audience can see you start from now on, like for the next 10 minutes, map you. Yeah. Uh, there, there are going to be things that are patterns. Like maybe you nod your head uh, in agreement every time you want to please me. Like I say something that they, and you do that and they will start saying, okay, here's a kind of a, a character of Sean that uh, is kind of revealing. And it's not everyone's, it's Sean's. And maybe you are the kind of guy who, when you're saying something that you're not sure about, you uh, nod your head left and right. So after enough time with person, you start figuring out what, again, what he calls those kind of uh, hotspots. You think this is something that this person does a lot. And then you, what you do next is once you say, okay, I have those up, you start doing experiments. And the experiments would be you, at the most extreme version, you ask them to lie. You say, tell me a lie. 
Like I'm gonna ask you now to tell me two stories. Don't tell me which one it is, but one of them would be true, one of them would be false, and you tell me both and try to convince me that both are true. So tell me two stories. And they would uh, have you tell the story and you don't know what the tells that they're looking into, but you, you just tell a story and it's a game for you. you. You have to tell a story and then a lie. And they would start verifying and say, okay, we think that he's lying on this one. They're ask you, which one was the lie? And you say, this one's the lie. I say, okay, we started uh, again. They might do it in a little less transparent way. Um, maybe they're gonna, so here's a, 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 another non-transparent way they do it. They ask you to tell a story. This is the context of now investigation, kind of FBI investigation. You tell a story, like this is what happened. Say, so now tell me the same story backwards. So typically if we make up a lie, we kind of like a movie, we have one version of it and we visualize it the way this story is in the movie. Like we, we enter the room and so on. We can't uh, change perspective because this is the story in our mind. But if you actually were in the room, if it was true, you can easily say, you know, you never mentioned where your girlfriend was. And we ask you, where was your girlfriend? And you, you were there. So you say, yeah, she was there. I didn't say it because it didn't seem important to me, but yeah, she was there. But if you just made up the story and there was no woman, there was no girlfriend, you just have now to make up a new fact. So it's a lot harder, yeah. How there, and then if you ask them to do it backwards to tell you kind of story like facts backwards, it's even harder because it breaks down and we can measure the response time, how long it takes you to, to add a fact and see that it takes you longer to add a fact in a made up story. Those techniques that are kind of FBI kind of 101 are the ones that he applied with the con artist and they seem to work. Wow, yeah. I, I, I kind of in relation to that, like, um. I, I don't know like how much hypnosis stuff is involved when like con artists are trying to, this happens with a lot of like, magic, magicians, I guess, but like a, a lot of them is like trying to get you to believe and get you into some form of like realm that they're trying to get you into. Um, like I, I don't even know how, how hypnosis work. Like are, are most people just more susceptible to being hypnotized and like, what is the process of a hypnotist to like go into that process? It's, it's a perfect question because we're not working on that. So you, you give me like a nice in to tell you about the yeah. work we're doing. So generally, what we know is that about 12% of the population on average are susceptible to hypnosis naturally. So you, you do the same thing to 100 people, 12 people will actually get into this state where they're more suggestible. You can actually start influencing them and 88% would just laugh at you. Like they wouldn't say, why are you kind of putting the pendulum in front of me? It's just like weird. And like, so they wouldn't even, they wouldn't understand and they wouldn't even believe that someone could kind of get into this state of uh, lucidity, uh, sleep lucidity because of that. So it's that kind of divided. Like it's either you in or you're out and it feels like, it's not like, oh, I felt something, but it was not as strong. No, it's like saying this was ridiculous. I don't what's going on. Or how could you not understand that this pendulum <laughs> makes me really kind of uh, see rhythm and so on. So that, that's kind of where we are. And so now that we know this 12% of that, we can investigate those people's brain. And it seems that what happens is uh, that they get into a stage that is very much looking like a stage of sleep where the senses are still receptive. You still can receive information and respond to it, but you're sleeping. Now, the nice thing about that is that once we characterize that this is what's going on, we can go to something that everyone experiences, which is sleep, and try to get that experience through sleep. And this is what we're doing right now in the lab. So we said, okay, not everyone responds to pendulum movements or to voice uh, whispering there is in the same way as in getting into hypnosis, but everyone sleeps. And when they sleep, most people go through the stages of sleep, like one to three, REM and so on, including the stage three, which is the entry to uh, hypnosis. So let's catch people out of the 88% that don't respond to hypnosis in this stage and try to do things to them then. And that's what we do right now in the lab. So we take people, we have to go to sleep, we monitor their sleep. So we know exactly like in real time, what stage of the sleep they are. And when they get to the stage that is the closest kind of in signal patterns of the brain to that of hypnosis, we put another machine on their head that uh, zaps their brain. So one machine just reads and kind of tells me what stage you are. Another machine activates part of the brain and we specifically activate not the entire brain, but uh, areas in the temporal regions and in the frontal regions. And we, we activate those, those regions in a specific frequency. So we zap the uh, brain with a specific frequency. It's very, very fast kind of stimulation. 
And all of that is done because we know that in these areas and in these areas, if you activate this frequency, you wake up types of cells that essentially have to do with your uh, alertness being activated. So what we do basically is we wake you up. But because we don't wake up the entire brain, we just wake up part of the brain that makes you become reasonable or, or kind of aware that you're awake, but you're still asleep. So we actually get you into a state of semi-hypnosis, which the way our subjects report that, that is lucid dreaming. So they basically stay asleep. They just wake up and they say, wait, I feel like I'm awake, but I'm still asleep because I know that I'm on Mars and I'm not on Mars. So what's going on here? Oh, I'm dreaming, but I'm controlling the dream because I'm the director now, not just a, an actor. I control the dream. So if that's the case, I want to try to see what I can do. And I think the majority of them say, I want to fly. If it works, I could fly right now. Boom, they take off and they fly above Mars. They say, okay, then I'm controlling my dream. So I want to now transport myself in the dream straight to uh, Iceland I've never been to. And I want to be in the uh, hot bath in Iceland. Bang, you're there. And it feels hot. And you, you actually are expensive because it's your brain who creates all the expenses. So you actually feel that. And those people choose for the X minutes that you are in control of your dreams before your brain kind of moves out of the different, to, to a different stage. You're navigating your dreams as you please and they choose to have fun with it most of them just to back up so are they are they like because you said you told them to wake up so are their eyes still closed yes at this point so they are really just it, it is lucid dreaming that yeah, it is, it's, it's lucid just dreaming, so, yeah and, and and the reason we went there is i said earlier that 12 percent of people experience about the hypnosis kind of could be to experience hypnosis easily and remarkably, about the rest of people experience lucid dreaming naturally. So they said, okay, there, there's something there. They look the same, they, they smell the same, and their numbers are the same. So let's kind of see if they work the same. And, and that was kind of how, what prompted us to look there. But what's nice is that we can do it for the 88% that don't experience hypnosis because their brain gets them already into the state of kind of being in this weird zone, and all we have to do is just wake up their consciousness to give them the ability to actually respond to the environment. So then we can talk to them and they hear us, but they're still in the dream. So we can say, hey, Sean, if you hear me right now, I want you to, your eyes are closed, but I want you to move your eyelids left and right and up and down and signal to me that you're dreaming, but that you're hearing me. And then they do this. And then we all say, okay, now he's in a dream. We can see that he, we can see by the brain that he's dreaming, but he's in control of the dream. So we're talking to him and he's hearing, and we can ask him to, uh, we can ask them to do math just to see if you're, if you're actually there. So we say, uh, now I'm going to ask you how much is two plus five and move your eyelids the number of times that, reflect, and we can see the eyelids kind of moving. So, so the guy is able to think. We ask them to, we do something with them. We, we tell them when they're awake to count uh, from one to 20 in their mind. So they say one, 20. And now we know how long it takes them to count to 20 in their mind when they're awake. And then when they're dreaming, we say, now in your dream, mark to us when you start counting and mark to us when you stop to get to 20. And we see how long it takes to count to 20 in their dreams. And then we can answer the question that was like standing forever, which is, is time in dream equal to time in awakeness? Like, is it really the same time roughly? So we could answer that question. It, it is. Uh, stuff like that. Interesting. And what, what, what are some of the things that you guys are testing or that have been tested? Because I could, I could see if someone can... Someone that generally isn't able to do lucid dreaming, but if through through hypnosis you can get them there and they can visualize any scenario that they want. I imagine there's a lot of positive things that you could do, like healing trauma, like going through some scenarios on your own, and you know, like are there things that have been worked out just to do alternative medicine? I don't know if you can even call that therapy. Yeah. Yeah. So so the the two kind of prongs or two kind of arcs of where this work is going one is therapy one is entertainment so mm. so and it's not surprising that those kind of go hand in hand uh, so on on therapy we basically can now we, now you're you're able to summon into your dream any experience you want in a controlled environment that is your brain so for instance if you uh, if you were in a tank that exploded and you keep having those memories but we want you to essentially be able to fix the go back in time to this moment and save your friend just so you will feel 
in your dreams, you can do that. And now, normally, you just wait for the dream to happen to be on that story, and like you just witness it. Now we can you can choose to turn on this evening where this explosion happened, and you can say, now I'm saving my friend, and, and he survives, and I can experience that, and he thanks me, and it's as real as it gets because it's your brain making up the movie. So so it it feels real while it happens. Uh, if grandma died and you never got to say goodbye. That's it in real life. But in dream life, you can bring her and now she shows up and it looks like grandmother. It smells like her. It's, from every perspective of your brain, you create a perception. So it's grandma. And now you talk to her. And even though your brain gives her the answer, you don't experience it. It's like, I'm going to tell her what to say. It's not a puppeteer. Like you actually think that she's answering normally. So you talk to her and you get closure. So all those things are fantastic ways to use this tool for therapy. And the other prong that's probably going to be the one that all the money is going to go through and thanks <laughs> yeah, yeah you can uh, you can go and uh, you want to see dinosaurs we, we make sure that your dream is kind of going to bring you dinosaurs and now you have jurassic park in real life it's whatever vr was supposed to give us but mm. didn't really give us because it's lame we can get from dreams like vr is is lame in the sense that even though it's pretty exciting when you see dinosaurs coming at you and you get scared you do this and it's over and knowing right. that you have the ability to do this makes it not as kind of emotional and affective is it real but dreams are real while they last so in that sense you experience you can go to mars right why, why spend all those 16 months back and forth traveling to mars and the risk of like explosion and you can just be on mars and it will feel like you're on mars it's it's, it's mm. as well as it gets in that sense i think that that's the kind of domain so what we developed that in the last couple of years i get calls from people who want to kind of use it in therapy one to ten compared to how many calls I get from like uh, Apple and the, the likes who say, when are we going to be able to uh, have a person go to sleep and get a dream by Spielberg? And I think, I think I'll give you one more kind of cool way. So it could be used by, you know, it could be used to give us entertainment, but it also could be used to connect us, uh, you know, when there's a pandemic and you buy yourself, you can every night get to be with people and then in that sense we can so so we can play with our brain to uh, if you go on a date right now let's say you and someone go on a date and you come back home and it was a lovely date and you go to sleep side by side you basically then separate so every date that's successful ends with us separating for 12 hours or seven hours into our own worlds just to reunite in the morning now we can not do that we can actually say let's go to sleep and we'll activate the machine that Moran's build so, so we're gonna share a dream. We're both gonna go to Mars, and we're both. So, mm. so then, so it's still gonna be your creation of Mars and my creation of Mars in our mind. But when I up in the morning, we can say, "Hey, what did you do when we were in Mars? And what, what, what was I doing in your dream?" And we can suddenly have like a shared experience. So, in a way, it it allows us to capitalize on hours that used to be just us alone in our mind and make them more communal. And I think it's great. Wait, so that movie, I forgot what that movie is called. The one that Leonardo DiCaprio does. Inception. Uh, Inception. So where they're hooked into a machine and like five of them are in this one dream, which is like, oh, okay, whatever. This is a movie. Are you saying that stuff can actually happen? So I think, I think in the movie, they went two stages down. They first, uh, they said that you and I really are in each other's dreams. We don't know how to do it. So it's still your brain. So we can agree when we're awake. We say, yeah, Sean. When you go to sleep, I'm going to turn on the machine. And it's going to wake you up and you're going to get control of your dream. I ask you to decide to take your dream to us going on a romantic uh, experience together in Hawaii. Agree? Agree. I'll do the same. When I get to the dream state and Moan wakes me up, I'm going to also go to Hawaii. And it's still separated in that I go to Hawaii, you go to Hawaii. It's not the same dream. We don't see each other. We see each other there, but it's I create you in my dream. You conjure me in your dream. But then when we wake up the morning after, we still have something to talk about. Like say, okay, how was mm. it for you? What was, where were you, where in Hawaii were you? I was in the Big Island. No, I went to, I went to Honolulu. Really, what did we do there? Well, we went to, so in a way it creates a kind of domain in which we can somewhat share an experience even though we, we saw different movies but we were in the same theater. Yeah. And I think that that's step one. That's question one. I, I imagine that if we kept like perfecting this thing, we might be able to do even better as in like nudge you even closer. So if we, for instance, have you guys wake up conscious wise in the same time 
and agree before that you're both going to dream in Hawaii. And then I spray the same smells in the room to kind of, uh, you know, give you the experience of the beach, let's say, in Hawaii. And you, your, your why becomes about the beach in Hawaii. And maybe I uh, play the sounds that make you hear the way. Maybe I can even make you closer uh, in what you experience as the dream and get, you know, to, the, to a level where in the end you really go to sleep and say we're going to dream in Hawaii. And you say, oh, it was amazing. We were in the same beach. We were uh, doing the same thing. That, that would be a really fun and advanced experience when it comes to people sharing experiences that otherwise they cannot share. You know, a poor person still dreams. So he can go to the most expensive, luxurious place in his dreams. That's a nice thing. Yeah, and imagine the closer you are with someone, like the, let's say you guys both went to, uh, as you mentioned, Hawaii together, you went to the same beach. I imagine that dream is going to be a lot closer than, let's say, you know, I was born in, uh, or like, let's say for Israel, like I have never been to Israel. So I have a very different perception of Israel. So even in my dreams, I can't dream the same thing that you might be dreaming because you obviously have a very close connection to Israel. Um, so I guess it's like way more efficient if you're dreaming about the same place that you both and I think that, I think that's actually beautiful. So, and I, I told you right now in your audience about Sinai Desert and me walking in the kind of valleys there and seeing the opium field. I created a visual in your mind and in your audience's mind. Now, even though you've, it's, I've, I've seen something and I can show you a picture, but you've not seen it. But there is something in your mind. You, you take whatever value you have in your memory and you apply that to the Sinai. You take whatever image you have of Hezat and you apply that. You have an image of opium and boom. It's fascinating to even have you now go to sleep. I activate your dream on that topic. Anyway, in the morning, you tell me what it is. Think about it in the context of Freud. Freud's entire kind of theory was let's have people wake up from a dream Tell us a story and we infer who they really are and what's their psyche. Now I can prompt you to whatever I want. Have you got to sleep? When you wake up, I'll ask you, Sean, what was the desert like? Uh, was there wind in your desert? Uh, did you feel that it was tiring? Was it the climbing up? Like every aspect of it is now yours. So, so whatever you conjure in your mind is your personality applied to a prompt I put. And now it's interesting because it tells you that yourself. If your desert was an unpleasant experience, then I can dive deeper and say, like, why was it for you unpleasant and for her such a good thing? Maybe you don't like uh, being alone. Maybe you don't like solitude. Maybe you don't like threats. So, so we can actually do psychology based on something that we can prompt you, which is what Freud, I think, was missing. He just had to rely mm -hmm. on you telling a story based on what you have without any provocation. Right, right. And it's all about sex. Basically, in the end, you want to sleep with your mom and kill your dad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So looking forward, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on with how this would apply when something like Neuralink comes into fruition and it, like it, is, is the hypnosis, all of this stuff, could that be eventually just done on demand with something like Neuralink that connects you? Like what is the potential? Like I understand right now, just like how, like, I think Viagra was like meant for better blood flow or something for your heart. And then people are like, oh, like it's an erection cure. <laughs> and yeah. like now it's curing paralysis for Neuralink, but it eventually will do multiples of other things. So I, I guess maybe an overview would be helpful for people just sure. to know how it works and like, what are the potentials of it that could unlock? Okay. So, so I guess if no one, if, if no one knows, we should say that Neuralink is a company that uh, aims to connect the brains to machines. And the approach that they have to doing that is invasive. So they say uh, inside your skull, you have your brain. The brain is made out of billions of little cells called neurons. And each cell speaks to another cell by emitting electric current. It's chemical ions that move there. If I put a voltmeter next to that cell, and this voltmeter measures very, very kind of fine electric activity, we can know what this cell says. Each cell, when it speaks, it's a thought. A thought is actually cells moving. So one cell, when it speaks, is you thinking about your mom. Another cell, when it speaks, it's you thinking about your dad. So if we know for each cell what is the thing it codes, and we can see that it's active right now, we know Sean is thinking about his mother. If the cell is firing, Sean is thinking about his mother. That is what thinking about your mother is. If this cell fire, Sean is in love. If this cell fire, Sean is hungry. So if we map all those cells, and if we listen to them, and we see that they're speaking, we can know what thoughts is running through your mind. What they do then is they build arrays of electrodes. They put those electrodes in the brains right now of pigs. 
and they put them next to cell and they wait for the pig to do things and they say, oh, every time the pig raises his left uh, leg, this cell fires. So this must be the cell that codes left leg. Every time the pig uh, licks its tongue, uh, this cell fires. So they kind of step one, map in their brains of pigs, cells to actions. And then they start doing fancy stuff. For instance, they zap those cells and they make the pig do stuff. So they zap the cell and suddenly the pig left, lifts his left uh, leg because you activated the thought. Or maybe you uh, kind of uh, hold the pig tight, but when he tries to reach for something, he activates the cells that would make him move his leg. So he can't move his real leg, but he thinks that thought to move his leg. And then you have a person go and grab the food that the pig wants and give the, the, the pig the food and the pig gets used to it not needing to even move the biological hand it, or leg. He just needs to think the thought and suddenly food comes and it basically creates a brain machine interface. You think a thought and something happens. So that's kind of where they are right now with the aim of mapping all of the pig's brain and then getting to humans and being able to do just that with humans. So you would sit in front of a computer, you would have this device in your brain, you would think uh, open email and email would be open because you thought the thoughts that activated the cells, we read them and we activated the computer. You say, order food and the food will be ordered and, and you could just do things with your mind. That's the kind of aim. Now, to your question on kind of where it's Exciting going stuff. in terms yeah. of experience, <laughs> if we get there, so it, it's, it's an uh, ambitious endeavor, uh, you know, to, there are billions of cells, even getting something inside the brain is difficult. The brain tries to fight for an object. So there's a lot of like technical things I'm glossing over as if we did it, as if we put the yeah, chip yeah. and we managed to read from, then we basically know how you experience the world. Now, here's the cool part. When you see me right now, what is seeing? It means photons from the screen go to your retina. They get uh, turned into the language of the brain, which is those chemical electrical signals. It goes to part of your brain that processes visuals. And boom, in the end, in your mind, you think you see me. But you don't really need me to be there for this to happen. If I can zap, zap those neurons inside your head, you can be eyes closed and you will still see me. Like you wouldn't even know if it came from your eyes or from within. So I can create an experience of you seeing me just by zapping the right cells. When you have food, you get food, you put it in your uh, throat. In the end, it turns to some electrical activity in your brain that says, hmm, yummy, I'm feeling full and so on. We don't have to have the food for that to happen. We can just activate things in your brain and you will feel full. So we can separate reality from perception. Everything you want, we can make you experience without the need for you to actually go through it. So you want to be in Mars? What does being in Mars mean? It means that you'll see Mars, you'll feel Mars, you'll smell Mars. We can give you Mars in the lab. That's the matrix kind of narrative, right? So everything is in your brain. And as long as we can activate the right cells, we can get you anywhere and anything you want in your mind. That's also Buddhism in many ways. Like you don't really have to respond to the environment. You just have to kind of control what you see. We're far from that, but that's the idea. And we know it's possible because we can do things mini small scale in the lab right now. We can uh, have people who are... Uh, trying to kind of uh, go through types of extreme diets, those are patients, and actually give them very nutrient-rich food, but not tasty, but zap the part of the brain that makes them feel like it's tasty, and they experience it as if it was tasty. So think about the ultimate diet. Right now, what makes you want a candy in the supermarket is that the sugar is making all kinds of chemicals in your brain run amok and make you feel pleasure. What if I gave you really healthy salad, but activate the cells in your brain that make you think it's candy. And now you eat unhealthy, or sorry, healthy food, think it's unhealthy, but you get the same experience. In that sense, the, the separation between oh. what's reality and what's perception becomes murky, and we can start controlling health in a very nice way. You don't have to eat unhealthy food to experience unhealthy food. We can give you whatever you want without the need to actually hurt your body. Damn, that's crazy. And how far are we from that, you think? So, so I, I kind of jumped over the black box, which is how do we get there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, so in pigs, they, they're doing very kind of good things. And pigs have, you know, a fraction of the number of neurons that humans have. We have 80 billion neurons and each neuron is connected to other neurons in up to 10,000 connections sometimes. So it's trillions of connections. It's quickly becoming something that is nearly impossible to just know which neuron in your brain codes your mom. We have to look for 80 billion uh, options and show them 80 thousands of uh, uh, stimulation to just map that. 
it's done in pigs because they have less neurons and less things they can do. It's done in rats, it's done in mice. So one question, it's just like, a, like DNA sequencing. It's a really, really long chain of things that you need to try in order to do it. But we did, uh, it took us decades, but we did DNA sequencing. So right. now the brain is the next frontier, which is possible. So that's, that's just a time thing. And then there are some technical things. Uh, we need to put stuff inside your brain. Right now, the only way we know to do it is to drill a hole in your skull and put a chip inside. Uh, not a lot of people are willing to go through this process, even though uh, because Elon Musk is such an exotic character and he's kind of uh, making people almost like a cultish behavior uh, say yes, I think he could do it. He could convince people to let surgeons drill holes in their brain and put chip inside. And, and he's not far from doing that because he has a machine that does it in a relatively kind of not too harmful surgery. So, so in that sense, the, the balance is like we need to get in your brain, a process in itself and risky and not kind of easy to do. And then we need to map. And I think that the technology is heading there. And now it's culturally, we have to decide if we want that. And we have to find people who agree to volunteer to be test subjects for something that is risky. I, I yeah. think that I, I see it happening in baby steps, but, but in our lifetime. I could see it happening in China, like in as soon as it's out, basically. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I think I think the way to go. I mean, I think this is where Neuralink is doing a good job. Is to start with healthcare. Like you say, let's take just patients with a problem. Alzheimer is the problem that they're after. People that whose brains are gonna fail them. They're gonna not be able to remember things. For these people, the idea of putting an implant in their brain that helps them kind of recover memories is desired. They mm. would be happy to have a neural implant. Put in their brain they would be happy to have someone map their memories so they can install them so let's start with them these are going to be the hook to get stuff into humans brains and do stuff once we show that we can install memories with these guys some guy is going to say you know what i'm willing to do it without having alzheimer and he's going to be wealthy enough to afford the convincing congress to let him do it despite regulations against and boom we have the first patient and maybe this guy will be smarter than all of us because he now has access to all of the world memory. He can communicate with Wikipedia and just know all facts and we start to see the benefit and then a lot of people will want it. It's kind of like going to space, right? Now one guy goes to space, everyone now wants it. Before long, the prices go down, everyone does it and travel to space becomes reality. That's kind of how it will be. Alzheimer hmm. first, rich guys, a lot of rich but less rich guys, everyone, prices go down. Suddenly you don't remember how it was before. And people say like, what? You didn't have neural implants in your brain when you were kids. How did you know what the date it was? How did you know how to get to places? You just looked at a device in your hands and you typed digits and this is so slow. And like, what if you got lost? What if there was no connection? How did you, but then suddenly it becomes like a, how could we live with this like old fashioned phones that were the only ways to know things about the world. And like eventually, I guess you're saying like they starting with the physical because it's like pigs similar. Like there's not as many connections in the neurons that are happening for physical parts, but I guess eventually we can even regulate emotions like people that are chronically depressed, they can remove that part of the neuron or turn that off that or, or increase the dopamine or serotonin levels and cure depression basically. And um, yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, I, I was gonna say, so full disclosure, I, I'm a lot of my students work for Neuralink and the like, so, so it's not like that I'm talking ah, about. So, 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 and, and where our lab is doing that with patients. So we are, we are opening the brains of humans putting electrodes inside their head and having them control their emotions. This is exactly a study that we did where we took people and we, so all the people, people work with our patients who have some brain disorder that requires surgery for clinical purposes. So these guys have epilepsy and the epilepsy is destroying their brain, so to speak, and we wanna stop it. And the way to stop it is to put something in their brain that will determine where the seizures onset is and then take it out. So that's the procedure that, that allows us to drill a hole in a person's brain, like really relatively big hole and put grid of electrodes on the surface of their head and read out from those electrodes for days until we catch the seizure onset and can resect it. And once we do that, clinically, we also have a human being with open brain sitting there and watching TV, waiting for him to have a seizure. So we can also do experiments on them. But we do exactly that is we show them movies that are emotional, that make them sad. And we look at which neurons in their brain light up when they feel sad. And we say, okay, we found sadness in your brain, kind of like the in and out movie. There is sadness. Then we show them a funny movie and they start laughing. And before they laugh, we see this cell lights up and say, okay, this is a happiness in your brain. And this is, I'm a little bit uh, simplifying it. Like it's usually sure, many sure, cells, sure. And, but like to make it easy, like happiness, sadness, anger, what are the other characters? I forget, there's a fear. 
Fear is actually the easiest one to find. So we find those, we map those cells first, day one, we show the movies and we see how cells in their brain light up when they experience those things. And then on day two, we tell them, look, we're gonna now show you the same movie again and again. And we ask you to watch the movie with your eyes, but try to control your emotions so that you won't feel fear. And because we have access to your fear objectively, we can see when you feel fear in your brain, we're gonna actually play a little kind of tone in the womb. When you're feeling fear, the tone is going to change its pitch. So we will know, and you will know that we know that you're experiencing fear right now. So in your mind, try to control the tone so it will be flat. Essentially, try to control your fear. And they extol things. So they start feeling scared and they try, okay, maybe I'm going to look away. Maybe, and they see that the tone changes. So, okay, this is the thing that for me controls fear. So they explore different things and every person explores something else, but they learn what trick is the trick that they should do to not feel fear what trick they should do to not feel sad. So because we have feedback from their brain and they can play with that, they learn from, from experimenting with their own brain how to control their emotions and boom, that's for life. So now they know how to not feel scared when they want to or how to not feel sad when they want to. It's different for each person. So we can't really generalize and say, okay, this is the way to not feel scared. But if you were to experience that, you now know something that for you is forever, how to not be scared. Wow. Yeah, there's so many possibilities. Like, um, so one of the people we interviewed was Tim Urban. He's the blogger Love of Wait By Why, and amazing. And oh, is it? Yeah. Uh, and he, I guess he interviewed like Elon Musk, and he was talking about the extinction of languages when something like Neuralink can come into fruition because yeah. the way we see languages and the way languages are and have been created is that there's so many limitations to it. So when I say something, especially through text or whatever, there's like there's so many interpretations that someone just doesn't understand of what I'm saying, even if we speak the same language, and even if we are from the same like city, let's say, and we have the same accents. Um, have you like looked into that at all in terms of like, creating almost new languages in the world of new links so that it's just like completely different uh, to the limitations of what we currently have today. And like, what, what, what are some of the potentials around that? So, okay, so it's, it's a cool idea. So, so Fetal Team is a good friend of mine. We, we spoke at Teddy 2016 together. So we got to practice together. We had hours of uh, lockdown cool. in the room, rehearsing the talk. So we kind of had a good kind of uh, going through a boot camp together. <laughs> so we stayed friends for a while. He lives on Papong here and we kind of updated his writing a book right now that I'm kind of uh, looking into. So, so really good friends. And I think that, the, I think, and he spoke to me when he, when he did the article about uh, Neuralink and about the brain. So, so we are even kind of uh, thinking together about the same ideas. I think that the, the point he's making, which I agree hundred percent is that if you, if you take a human being from today and put them 10,000 years ago in the past, time machine to the past, you will see that a lot of things have changed in our body, in our thinking and so on, but communication did not. They speak with their mouth, we speak with our mouth, we kind of, that's the one thing that in our kind of technology wise didn't change at all. We still use a very, very old fashioned mechanism to communicate ideas. And it's not far from the one used by most animals. They still have mouth and they still use the mouth to take idea in the brain, turn it into movement of like molecules in the air, transmit it to another party that uses the ears to turn those molecules back into sound, interpret and until it becomes an idea, you had like to go through seven hops. And then we don't even know that when I say potato, you hear the same thing and you experience the same thing. It's like a telephone game in your mind. Mm. So that's a really, really strange thing that we still use the same thing when in my mind, potatoes are very clear. Like if I could just duplicate my thought into your thought, we can save all the effort of communication. And also we can make sure that what you see is what I meant. Think about relationships. Like how many times do you talk to someone and you say, no, you don't understand me. Like I'm saying the words, but that, that's all of what it is, right? Like you, you, this think morning. That, yeah, <laughs> you say something and you think this is all it means. Like I just said, this is what I want. And somehow it doesn't land in the other. So, so if we can just use, the, if I know how potatoes look in your brain, like what cells light in your brain when you take potatoes, what cells light up in my brain when you take potatoes, I can just, when I read those cells here, I will zap those cells here and ensure that you see what I meant. So that's step one. It also means that we can start seeing and thinking more things that we don't think right now. That's where the science fiction, it thinks that that's kind of where I, I would take it one step further. First of all, it will be, we, don't, we wouldn't need fa uh, the mouth anymore, right? Like they would be redundant. Like we can, we can do other things with the mouth, serve other purposes. So, so that's like just functional. Uh, also, we would be uh, able to, do things collectively like maybe i'll I will share thoughts such that uh, we'll solve a problem by maximizing the yield of multiple brains 
also we might not need to be in the same room right now you know we're talking kind of in one way not being in the same room we could do it in much more efficient way like thought like thoughts could travel across brains to mars and back in fraction of like, uh, like time that they do right now because we could be much more efficient it would also help people like me i speak very fast i'm sure that some of the audience are playing it in like half speed just to understand <laughs> what i'm saying yeah, uh, yeah. so if, if I need, it would even help in communication now take it one step further we both speak english we had to learn the language but what like this is a, a barrier for billions of people who don't understand our language but there's no need like there's potatoes in china there are potatoes in saudi arabia all we need to do is translate my thought into their thought and kind of overcome this barrier of the need to find the right meta communication like we just need to communicate the idea we don't need to communicate it in whatever words so, so language becomes kind of obsolete we can just look at ideas and it even goes to and that's the farthest i can imagine right now uh, changing how we think because we are limited by our language that's something that wittgenstein said like we can't think thoughts that we don't have words for mm. so the, the 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 kind of cloud of thoughts that are possible is this big but the clouds of words is this small and essentially we narrow we we narrow our thoughts into only things we can say a word for so we invented a unicorn it doesn't exist but because we invented it everyone has in their mind unicorns but we but if there's another animal that no one saw that we didn't name you just can't imagine it like you can't speak about this animal because what would it mean to you that it would mean like a kid that invents an animal tells his parents uh, it's a animal that has two horns and then now he creates like a, by language he creates a new association in their brain that they can use but we're limited by those things so now we could expand our limitation i'll give you a concrete example not sure that's not theoretical there's a uh, tribe a tribe in in australia uh, they're aboriginal called the cook tire cook tire they're kind of speaking their own language and they have different style of language they don't have the word left and right in their language they just don't have those words because they don't have those words they don't have a concept of this is on my left this is on my right they don't have this they don't understand that the world could be aligned to you so you kind of everywhere you go there's always left and right they, they think that the world is not centered on them because of that they would say things like hey sean you have an ant crawling on your northeast arm so that's how, because they use directions to, to and, yeah. and because of that, their brain is different than ours, so that they always know where North is. So you can take a cook tire person and have them close their eyes, turn them around 50 times, and they open their eyes, they will still say, this is North. Like they wouldn't understand what's the issue there because it's like, oh. I'm asking you after 13 rounds, where is left? Says so left is here because left is always the, this arm. You don't even have a concept of it. So in that sense, by changing the language, by having words for things or not having words for things, we can actually create different realities. Yeah, it even reminds me of like, you know, J J Japanese is one thing that I quote from, but like J Japanese people, they would have like certain specific terms and, and nomenclature where like, if you were to describe that in English, like let's say like Kaizen, I think, which means like constant growth. And like, sometimes like you need a paragraph to describe a one word in Japanese. Uh, and I'm sure the same thing is in Hebrew. Like it's just certain phrases, certain, certain, certain quotes that you just can't really understand in one language but you can shorten it in one word of another language uh, and it just that's probably like exponential of what we could do with Neuralink because, that, because, like because that's one of my advice in the column I think you should people should learn more than one language like just doesn't matter how, which ones but if you know if you have two languages you become aware you're made aware of this thing that one language doesn't cover all of the space of possibilities you just as soon as like there's a word in Hebrew, beteavon, which is bon appetit in French, which is enjoy your food. It doesn't exist in English. And it's so amazing for me. Like I'm sitting with friends and I want to say kind of enjoy the food. And I can say enjoy the food, those are three words, but they don't convey the same meaning that it's a missing word. Like you just, and by having, you know, I, I, I was born in France. I spoke French first. I spoke Hebrew afterwards, speak English now. It, you can see right away how there are concepts that are missing culturally and psychologically because mm. you don't have words for them. And that's it, like Americans don't understand uh, this feeling that every French person understands because they don't have the word for that and they have to really kind of break it into different experiences. And that's a fun yeah. kind of exercise for everyone to see what words you can experience because you have two languages. Yeah, and the potential of that is like, you don't feel as big of a connection and mm. you don't feel like they're in the same tribe as you. And a lot of the times that's why there's conflicts around the world, right? That's why there's like, your racism that's why there's wars and like there's so many things that happen from these barriers
I'll give you another example that's, that's, ten, that's kind of still into my mind right now. I'm studying German right now. And uh, my, I would say, even though my mother tongue is French, the language I spoke most of my life was Hebrew. I was raised in Israel. I spoke that for the longest amount of time. If you watch uh, an Israeli news show, and you have two kind of people from two parties in the show, they ask one guy a question, he starts answering, halfway to the sentence, the other guy starts screaming at him, and before long, it becomes like a screaming argument. So how could you say that you're a racist, you're an, a terrorist? Like that's, and then you hear people, and, and usually the anchor says, please guys, stop, please guys, stop. That's, that's a typical Israeli news TV show. You get one sentence each, and then they start screaming at each other. In German, what, the way I learned right now, sometimes the sentence begins, and it says like, I love uh, ice cream not. So it means I don't love ice, ice cream. But the word not is the word that negates the sentence appears at the last word. So if I stop you in the middle of a sentence, I wouldn't even know if you're gonna say that you love ice cream or you don't. Like the sentence begins the same way and only the last word tells you if this entire sentence was like reversed or not. Or mm -hmm. I love ice cream question. So, oh, it was like, do, the question, do you like ice cream? So you have to wait patiently to the end of the sentence to just know what the person is about to say. Just this yeah. breakdown means that two people on TV can't argue until the guy is finishing his sentence because you don't know what he's about to say. You have to wait for him to say something all the way to the end before you can start screaming at him. Because Hebrew allows you to figure out what he's about to say after three words, they never wait. It's like screaming match halfway in. And just this thing makes me see, oh, I see now why Germans are a lot more polite than Israelis mm -hmm. and why maybe Israelis, when they go to a board meeting, they're so quick and they kind of come up with it so fast because they don't need to complete the idea. They, they have to start the idea. The other person already knows. This language makes entire culture work logically in my mind now. Do you think that's why you're able to talk so fast? Is because <laughs> of the language making sure that you learned through Hebrew? I, I, I bet so. So I'm, I'm a product of a very weird upbringing, right? I'm, I was born in France. In French, you don't have breaks. Like you always use a sound to say, I uh, go to a, like you always, if you don't have anything to say, you just say, eh. but so you always <laughs> make sounds. So that's the French approach. The Israeli approach is you have to speak very fast and you get to the point quickly because you won't get to finish an idea. So, so mix that together. I always make sounds. I speak very fast. I speak in a different language that is not my, my mother tongue. So I feel like I need to compensate by thinking a little bit further into the future, what I'm going to say and throw it out. All of that, you know, I, I teach MBA students. Uh, and so I have a class full of people and I have to con convey ideas to them and they often complain that I speak too fast. So I do my best to speak slower and be kind of more uh, calm and so on. And it fails miserably. You know, as soon as I get excited about some idea, it becomes uh, faster to the point that one time I brought an expert to the woman. I said, look, all my students complain, sit here, tell me what I can do. Like maybe, maybe there's something like I can breathe differently. I can, I don't know, uh, use different. And uh, he said, for six weeks in my class, kind of taking notes and coming up with advice. And he said that the only thing that uh, happened after he's sitting in my class six weeks is that he started speaking fast too. He said, uh, <laughs> that not I'm only that right now, right now, <laughs> so you ruined me and I don't know how to, I think, I think his answer was that uh, uh, some people, and I think that he, this was his analysis of me, who knows it's too, they think in concepts rather than in words. And they give each concept the same amount of space. So if I, say something like, uh, if I talk about the Milky Way galaxy, those are three words, Milky Way galaxy. But because it's one concept, I basically jam it in the same space. Like if I say, I like ice cream, or I like the Milky Way galaxy, it's the same uh, space. Same thing. Said, yeah. That, that's how he said, this was his analysis of how I think. And he says, if you think this way, and that's maybe a product of you coming from a different language, then it leads to you having a hard time talking to people who think in three words, because you don't like you you don't give them space. They have to kind of, and then they have to pass what you just said slowly, kind of say Milky Way Galaxy. But you're already moving ahead, so they are catching up to you. <laughs> Not a pleasant experience for the audience, I'm sure. I hope that I, I'm apologizing for whoever is listening to us right now, uh, especially if you don't see, uh, but you listen to it in audio. Apologize. Yeah. Uh, you can play it in half speed, and I promise to you that in half speed <laughs> <it> sounds better. <laughs> Maybe the, the next language you learn after German is like identifying the slowest <laughs> language speakers in the world. Like, I don't know what language that would be. And, and then try to master that. And that would even things out or something. But C++. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Um, Moran, uh, I think this is a great way to close off. Uh, where can people learn more about you? Obviously, you're doing you're working on so many different things, but um, beyond your website, moransurf.com, where can people find out more about you and what you're doing? So, because I have this uh, consortium of uh, human performance that I'm helping right now, it has all kinds of athletes in the sport companies and people from different companies that try to uh, help improve human performance. We're starting a video kind of series that uh, explains a lot of the brain. It's going to be on YouTube. Still, probably, if you look up my name, it's where you're going to find this thing. And I would say if any of those ideas that we spoke about is interesting to you, there's going to be a one-hour version of them. Really oh, I so it. I think just YouTube and my name, I bet by the time it's out, probably you'll hear about it. And I that will it. be a good place. All right, well, we'll link it down. I'm definitely going to check that out. So, Ron, again, thank you so much for coming on. I didn't even talk about 50% of the things that <laughs> we, I wanted to talk about. So I think around three. And we spoke fast. It's only... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. I try my best. I try my best. But We'll do um, it again. We, we, we did it during the pandemic. Uh, we'll do it happily anytime you want. Yes, hopefully in the non-pandemic, non, non-war season. So, um, now appreciate you coming out once again. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in once again. Thank you, Sean.